Hello, I'm Charles Menzi. I'm pleased as the uh, chair of the committee to uh, give you an overview of uh, the work that we did with an emphasis on uh, some of the key data gaps and information needs that we're hoping will be addressed during this workshop. The workshop uh, committee was quite diverse uh, as we were covering a wide range of uh, topics from uh, ecological topics to toxicological topics to human behavior and um, implications for sun exposure. Uh, we were supported by a great staff with the National Academy uh, who really uh, carried us forward. And importantly, this, this study was uh, uh, funded by the uh, US Congress and uh, sponsored by the US Environmental Protection Agency. The report itself um, was designed to provide information for future application and ecological risk assessment on the environmental side. And to that end, uh, the committee reviewed the available information on sources of uh, UV filters in the environment, uh, their fate processes, the measurements of those chemicals in the water, sediment, and biota, and their environmental effects. And we provided our findings and knowledge gaps in each topic area, as well as overarching conclusions and recommendations that I'll, I'll speak to today. As a result of the, of the, uh, the work that was done, it was decided that it made a lot of sense to have a follow-up workshop that you'll be participating in. And uh, that workshop, will focus on the aquatic environmental effects. So a, a key portion of the, uh, of the information that was brought to bear to think about ecological risk assessment. On the first day, we'll be looking at the analytical challenges working with UV filters. And these are critical for achieving accurate toxicity metrics. And on the second day, We'll be looking at toxicity testing with a focus on testing on non-standard organisms. Throughout, we will discuss and encourage progress on knowledge gaps across the government, industry, and academia. Now, many of you are you know, familiar with the idea of bringing information together at various levels. <clears throat> so with regard to effects, um, what this diagram shows is on the far left, beginning with simpler tests such as QSARs and extending all the way to the right with model ecosystems and in situ biomonitoring, uh, effects information might be gathered. And the notion is that at each stage, you learn something more and you reduce the uncertainty about understanding the effects and or the exposures. Uh, Often this is, uh, approach is put into a tiered system where you do simpler tests first and then you may progress. But this is the uh, committee's thinking in terms of how one would uh, bring together uh, the appropriate toxicity information for addressing the uh, risk questions at hand. Now the committee looked at 17 UV filters, specifically those that are marketed in the U US. 15 of these, are organic chemicals, and two, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are inorganic chemicals. And the study looks at each and develops information for each. One of the challenges in working with these chemicals is dealing with their chemistry and being able to analyze them properly in a way that we both understand what exposure levels are in test systems, as well as in, environment, in the environment. So with regard to the hydrophobic, um, the hydrophobic or organic UV filters, uh, there's a variety of, of uh, processes that can occur once these enter, enter into the water. And these include, um, everything from the physical mixing uh, to absorbing to uh, various organic particles that might be in the water to becoming deposited in sediments as a, re as a result of that adsorption, uh, 
to transformations, either biodegradation type transformations or uh, through photolysis, photolysis from the sun. Uh, there's a range of um, hydrophobicity across these compounds, some being very uh, hydrophobic and more likely to want to bind to uh, organic um, materials in the water or be uh, taken up by animals and plants. Some are very soluble, such as solu uh, salicybenzone. And then there are others that are in between, such as oxybenzone, which is moderately water soluble. For the inorganic uh, UV filters, uh, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, there are also a variety of things that may happen once they're in water. Um, th these two can include photoreactions, um, dissolution, as in the case of zinc oxide, which re um, readily dissolves, as well as forming agglomerates and settling to the sediments. It would be a very common thing for tiny particles of these uh, uh, particular UV filters. Uh, with, re with respect to biodegradation and biodegradability, uh, bio bio uh, there are a number of standard tests for biodegradation, but these are designed for wastewater for the most part. And they do indicate that a number of compounds are non-biodegradable, um, uh, including avabenzone, dioxybenzone, octocrylene. Um, there are very few tests that have been done that look at the biodegradation of these compounds in natural water systems. With regard to photostability, um, we do know that oxybenzone and salicybenzone appear to be relatively photostable in uh, laboratory settings. Avobenzone, which is commonly used in many sunscreen products, can be photostable, but that's highly dependent on the molecular scale of the environment. And frankly, the photostability for other UV filters is largely unexplored. The committee looked at uh, the propensity of these chemicals to bioaccumulate into, uh, into uh, aquatic life. Uh, that may come from chemicals in the sediments, from the water, or via the food, path, food chain pathways. And on the right, uh, we have the information for the organic uh, UV filters that kind of shows their KOWs, which is a, a measure of how likely they are to uh, want to be present in fat versus water. And you can see that there are a number of compounds, a select number of compounds that have higher, uh, uh, what we call KOWs, partitioning coefficients. Um, examples of those are, are avobenzone and octocrylene would have high ones, while others are low, such as salicybenzone. And, and that one will therefore dictate to some degree where those chemicals will come to reside with respect to aquatic biota. There have been a number of high quality laboratory based tests uh, and information available. And on the, on the right here are seven compounds for which we have information that provides insight on their uh, bioaccumulation, which could be described for the, for the group as a whole as ranging from low to moderate uh, bioaccumulation. There are a number of knowledge gaps uh, to be considered in understanding the exposure and, and testing dosages. Most of the understanding of physical chemical parameters comes from laboratory or pure water experiments and modeling platforms. Photo transformation of the UV filters in aquatic environments, that is without the use of solvents, is significantly understudied. Limited data exist on the role of some common coatings applied to inorganic UV filters on their aggregation or dissolution. Field studies of tissue concentrations lack comprehensive characterizations of UV filter exposure in water and sediment. We do know that these chemicals accumulate in marine and aquatic organisms, but the statement means that we don't understand what the exposure re regime was that led to those, real, those uh, specific body concentrations. And there's a need for standard guidelines on bioconcentration under laboratory conditions for saltwater organisms. 
and improve studies of critical body residues in acute and chronic exposures to understand bioaccumulation and toxicity. Several UV filters are really difficult and challenging to work with. Uh, and this impacts both uh, uh, toxicity testing and monitoring the environment. Um, the diagram shows some of the glassware involved and some of the steps involved in e making measurements either in connection with uh, toxicity testing studies or field studies. And there's lots of op opportunities here for the chemicals to absorb to containers to be lost from containers. And so this is a, this is a key challenge in, in, in understanding what are the true dose response relationships in doing uh, toxicity testing, as well as what are the true exposures, uh, accurate exposures in, um, in aquatic and marine environments. So a key knowledge gap here is that robust chemical analytical procedures are needed to better reflect UV filter concentrations over time and space. And that is both at the scale of a test system, a toxicity test system, and in the environment. This may include minimum replicates and reliable standardized methods developed to, to collect, extract, and process samples so that they accurately measure the UV filters. This includes minimum QA, QC procedures. For example, analytical and in uh, matrix uh, recovery spikes and the like. Uh, I'd like to now turn to uh, uh, information on the ecotoxicology of the UV filters. The committee did a, I would consider a fairly rigorous review of the available studies. Uh, we understand that EPA will eventually do uh, its own review, but this helps tee up the studies for consideration for ecological risk assessment purposes. So category one studies were those that were considered uh, useful for ecological risk assessment directly. Category two were studies that may be useful to ERA or provide additional knowledge. Um, there was a group that was not considered for ERA because of study limitations such as inadequate controls or some other aspects of the study. And then there are studies that include non-ERA endpoints. And these are discussed in the report in a section referred to as studies informing modes of action. Now, you've all have the report and uh, the details on these toxicity studies are assembled in several supporting appendices, which are important to review. Appendix E includes the UV filter toxicity data. Appendix F includes studies on behavioral and physiological endpoints on select organic UV filters. So it'd be good to peruse those and be familiar with them in advance of the meeting. Um, I'd like to touch on laboratory toxicity testing information a bit. And I'm using here uh, the data that we've assembled on acute toxicity. Uh, the figure shows the LC50s on the uh, y-axis in micrograms per liter. And on the x-axis are the are compounds that have been tested, including um, a number of the organic compounds and the two inorganic compounds. There is a line, a dashed line at uh, 1,000 micrograms per liter, 10 to the third, that we use as a gauge in making some judgment about whether uh, toxicity values tend to be higher or lower than that value. And we use that value because it helps us orient to the, um, what we know of the measured concentrations in the environment, which are, for the most part, um, range up to maybe 10 micrograms per liter. Uh, although there are individual values that can, for some compounds that can get higher than that. So as you can see from this figure, acute toxicity has been observed under that 1,000 microgram per liter uh, gauge for several of the compounds. Uh, the toxicity values typically exceed solubility for the poorly soluble UV filters. So if you look at the figure on the right, you see these dashed lines. 
here, 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 and here. Those are the solubility limits for those compounds. And so if we take um, this chemical, for example, you see that the, the available data exists above the solubility limit. Here's one where we have something below the solubility limit. But much of the data, well, for these are existing above the solubility limits. Um, while not shown here, chronic studies are limited across all UV filters. And we'd really like to get at that because of the nature of the exposure. The uh, toxicity uh, information is also given uh, for, in a couple of cases, uh, for chemicals for which we had sufficient data. So oxybenzone acute data is on the left and oxybenzone chronic is on the right. And you can kind of see where the, uh, 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 the HC5 is and the LCL values here on the far left for the acute and for the chronic. These can also be put together for zinc oxide for acute and chronic and octane oxate and titanium dioxide for acute only. But that is largely the limits of the available data. So other effects that uh, are addressed in the report that you may consider uh, during the course of the workshop include how to think about mixtures uh, because uh, UV filters are typically used as mixtures there might be several in a several in a uh, in a particular application. Uh, they exist in the environment as mixtures, and if you make measurements in the environment, you could find three, four, five UV filters present detected. So mixture considerations may be important in terms of how they may uh, act together uh, among themselves and with other other chemicals. Also important are studies informing modes of action. So there's a section in the report that's devoted to this, and we uh, flag uh, the idea of new approach methods and methodologies because you know we certainly understand that's a direction that EPA would like to go in in the future. Um, multiple stressors are key considerations, uh, especially in. Um, in marine and, and aquatic environments where there's a, there are other stressors taking place, in particular, those associated with global warming. Uh, so water temperature can be an important consideration and how that might interact with the presence or influence the toxicity of, of uh, chemicals that may be pre in the water as well. Uh, we note um, uh, in the report, um, information on threatened and endangered species. Uh, a number of the uh, marine systems or species and freshwater systems are threatened and endangered. And um, it, may, it therefore may be of value to think about uh, toxicity testing that would serve to inform uh, the potential for effects on these types of species. And that would be obviously using surrogate species for them. And finally, uh, communities and ecosystems. Um, systems such as coral reefs are complex, uh, both in terms of communities and ecosystems, and there's a lot going on there. And so that effects on one aspect of that system can have effects on other aspects of that system. And the report talks about that. Now, some of the key knowledge gaps um, that will serve to uh, inform higher tier risk assessment, including the creation of those uh, uh, SSDs when deemed necessary, include toxicity tests for non-standard organisms, especially marine organisms, toxicity, toxicity tests on benthic organisms uh, that may be exposed to UV filters present in the sediments, uh, effects from UV filter degradates, there is uh, a level of biodegradation and photolysis that occurs in these environments. Studies that distinguish among inorganic particulate properties other than particle size. Uh, effects on community and ecosystem dynamics. And finally, studies that link downstream cellular, tissue, organ, individual, and population responses to population endpoints. 
Here, we're obviously referring to the development and use of uh, adverse outcome pathways. Um, we were uh, found that we were, we were unable to complete such a pathway uh, given the available information. Uh, the conclusions of the report include this matrix, which I'll just touch on. And just because you might find it um, useful in thinking about um, um, the chemicals as you come to the workshop. So this is arranged uh, with the chemicals across the top in alphabetical, alphabetical order, although the organics and then the inorganics. And it's organized into categories. So this first one up here is UV filter production, and then that's followed by environmental fate and exposure. And the idea is that this is, uh, these provide synopses of information we know about the compounds. And they're color coded. So where something has um, maybe has a lower influence on the environmental conditions, either in terms of exposure and effects, it may get a blue color. If it has a higher uh, potential influence, it might get a brown color like this, orange color. If it's in the middle, it might be a yellow color. So when you look at this collectively, it's handy, it's a handy way to kind of see where the blues and oranges and yellows cluster and what information is available uh, about these chemicals. And, and, and this really serves to identify where some of the key uh, data gaps are on a per chemical basis. The committee made uh, two recommendations uh, which bear on the, the work of this workshop. Uh, the first is that EPA should conduct it conduct an ecological risk assessment for all currently marketed UV filters and any new ones that become available. This was seen as an urgent need driven by the evidence of local exposures of aquatic organisms and UV aquatic ecosystems to the UV filters, potentially including endangered species and experimentally demonstrated potential for environmental impact, either alone or in context of other system stressors. And you may recall that one figure I showed you with the, the dashed line at 1,000 and where the um, measurements and estimates of UV filters were in the environment, those were within an order of magnitude or two. And uh, given the uncertainties in the information, it's, it's easy to see how those could come to converge or overlap, which is why we think it's urgent to look at this. The results of that ERA um, that eventually gets uh, uh, conducted uh, by the agency would then we would recommend be shared with FDA for their considerations of the environment and their oversight of UV filters. Our second recommendation is that EPA and, and partner agencies such as NOAA and others and the sunscreen formulators and the UV filter manufacturers should conduct, fund, or support and share research and data on sources, fate processes, environmental concentrations, bioaccumulation studies, modes of action, and ecological and toxicity testing for UV filters alone and as part of sunscreen formulations. And on the human health side of this, we additionally recommend that epidemiological risk modeling and behavioral studies related to sunscreen usage should be conducted to better understand human health outcomes from changing availability and usage. The workshop will serve to inform uh, the first part of this recommendation um, with regard to the potential for effects of UV filters. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I, I highly recommend that you all uh, review the report and uh, with special attention to uh, obviously to the effects section, but also to get the context of the, uh, of that, of, of the, uh, that from a human, from an ecological risk standpoint, from looking at the, uh, the other chapters as well. Thank you very much.